from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. That's an, on page 806 in the Old Testament portion of the P Bible, if you wish to follow along. Listen again to the word of God. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath or spirit to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Be to God. <clears throat> well, in the spirit of Senior Sunday, I'll take you back to a little bit of high school football glory days. So this is, I mean, 99. This is 94 to 96, or as my kids would like to remind me, the 20th century. So I grew up in Dallas. Uh, I graduated from Lake Highlands High School, and i got to say, we were pretty, pretty, pretty good. I'm not sure when Lake Highlands started to run the triple option wishbone, but I will say that even when I was in junior high, we were preparing to run that once we got to high school. Now, the wishbone is about the complete opposite of today's seven-on-seven spread offenses, right? They're all pass first. I think we threw the ball maybe three times a game. All right. That's, if, a, if a team did that today, the coach would be fired for just being out of touch. It, on one hand, it was such a throwback, yet our coaches kept innovating the system. And so a lot of teams just didn't know how to stop us. That's why you watch college football, like, like Georgia Tech or some of the service academies, they'll keep, they'll catch another school slipping, sleeping and catch them off guard, and we'll beat them every now and then. Well, at our home stadium, uh, just above the press box, there was this sign, and uh, it welcomed the, the visiting team and the fans, right? And it said, welcome to the Boneyard. We thought that was pretty cool, I guess. Pretty much every game we played there, right, we destroyed everyone's hopes of victory, crushing their bones, figuratively, Maybe sometimes, literally, hopefully not too much. But 
I think about that and then this valley that God led Ezekiel into, right? All that was missing was that sign hanging over the top of it. Welcome to the boneyard. This had to be much more terrifying, right, than a football field. I mean, as I was kind of reading this, I was like, this sounds more like, you know, if we had, if we had a, a church service on Halloween and not Pentecost, like, there'd be the, a great reading for that. How did the nation of Israel get to such a place and state? Whenever you read about the exile, you'll notice it's often spelled with a capital E. That's because apart from just a few instances in history, like the exodus uh, out of Egypt, the anointing of David, the return from the exile, it ranks at the top of the most significant events in Israel's history. Prophets warned of Israel's military defeat as early as the 8th century BC. Uh, we know how uh, Israel divided itself into two kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdoms. The north fell to the Assyrians around 722 BC. Then around 597 BC, the, the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, conquered Judah, which included Jerusalem and the temple, and they deported the citizens to Babylon. Now, we can deduce that Ezekiel was a very important public figure because he was one of the first people shipped out. So we cannot underestimate the gravity of the exile. We cannot underestimate the destruction of the temple. These events combined to be a traumatic national disaster. Combined with an overwhelming crisis of faith. Now, the prophets to had told Israel this would happen because of their collective sin, right? They, uh, they, they lost the promised land that was graciously given to them after wandering in the wilderness. Uh, their king, who was of the Davidic line, had been taken captive, held in prison, and brought into Babylonian courts. So everything that the Israel people and nation cherished was either taken away or destroyed. It might be difficult to identify which of these losses was the most devastating, but you can make a case that the temple topped them all. I mean, the land would always be there. Kings are replaceable, but the temple served as the most sacred place where God and his people met. It was there they offered their sacrifices for the atonement of their sins. The temple is where the Jewish people humbled themselves in times of national and personal distress. It was that one visible, tangible reminder that God was present with them. After its destruction at the hand of the Babylonians, the exiles were left wondering if their relation with, with God had come to an end. Their national character and their spiritual life were represented solely by death, a boneyard. There are times and circumstances in our lives that our outlook appears very grim. But here what we see is that in a valley of even very dry bones, there is hope. So let's look at this prophetic vision of hope given to Ezekiel and God's people. If you've read or dabbled much in Ezekiel, this is one of the most best-known parts of the book. There's actually a, a parallel vision to this in chapter 3. And God brings them to the same valley as before. And we again read that phrase of the hand of the Lord. Now, previously Ezekiel was there 
to receive an oracle of doom. But here, he is to receive an oracle of hope. It's a message of good news that people can live, that people can be invigorated by the Spirit of God on this side of the grave. It's good news to exiles who have been oppressed by political forces that dominated that, that their existence. It's good news to exiles who live and suffer with the guilt of their sins, of their nation, sins of their ancestors. This is good news that God's Spirit can and will give life. And this good news comes in a vision in the valley that represents Israel's state of national death. The bones are dry of any marrow. They've been bleached by long exposure to the elements, right? It is a, a really creepy vision. But we have to understand that bones symbolized more than what once physically existed. In the ancient world, it was thought that if the bones are strong and firm, then the soul is strong. It manifests itself just as well in them as in the heart or any other vital organ. Therefore, the bones are the soul. So here the dialogue begins concerning life and death. Right? God asks mortal, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's answer isn't an evasion, but simply, simply an acknowledgement of the source of life, right? Oh, Lord God, you know only God could accomplish such a feat. And God does it using two instruments, word and spirit. First, God speaks to the bones through the words of the prophet. Those words cause the bones to come together. Now just imagine the noise of all those bones colliding and connecting and rattling as they worked to reform bodies. The bones then developed tendons and flesh, but they were not yet alive. And that required God's breath, right? And this is one of my favorite Hebrew words. This is one we can all say. It's really fun. It's, you know, if you need a cough, you've got a little something in your throat. <clears throat> it's perfect. Ruach. Right? R-U-A-H. Ruach. It means wind or spirit. Just think back to Genesis 2 when God transformed Adam into a living being by breathing into his nostrils the breath of of life. Right? The work of the Holy Spirit is here and alive because the Spirit stands for vitality. The revived army stands, but their words still convey a pessimism when they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Their national hope is as hopeless as resuscitation, as bones lacking marrow can hope to live again. And what hope can be taken from something like a withered branch cut off from a tree or a limb severed from its body? These bodies here in Ezekiel are a lot like us sometimes. Even after this miracle of revival, they still cannot believe or see God's presence. They still fear that the covenant is dead. And that's because their vision is inward seeking, it's inward serving. The hope that they cannot find or produce themselves is sure and present in God because he calls them as his people. The covenant is not dead. Death does not permanently reign over them. He brings them out of their graves. The, the Jews had considered the lands of captivity as their graves. 
in their restoration was to be called life from the dead. This is the vision of what was to come. Now, both Isaiah and Jeremiah preached a return from captivity, but this vision goes farther by seeing the time when the dead nation would become alive again. Even though this may not be the, the usual preaching text on Pentecost, poor Clara had to suffer through Acts 2 uh, for us, really for me. Just, thank you for doing that. Similarly, can you not hear that the sound of that mighty, violent, rushing wind going through the valley as it did the room with the apostles? That's because it's the same spirit, the same breath, the same ruach from Genesis 1 and 2, Ezekiel 37, Acts 2. The story is powerful and it's brought hope to many for thousands of years because it tells us the power of God can change even the most hopeless of lives and circumstances. So today, what are the dry, bleached bones that sit among and around us? Perhaps it's a personal relationship with someone that needs repair and mending. Maybe parts of our faith and spirituality need a blast of God's life-giving spirit. As a church, what kind of bones can we identify here? Whatever it is that appears dead. Whatever resides in the boneyard, new life is possible only through God's word and spirit. And I, know that, and I know that God's ruach is at work here because I've seen it, I've felt it. And I know that with his word and our partnership as his people, we can work together for his mission of reconciliation to transform life. So, Lord God, give us the vision and insight to acknowledge our dry bones so that your Ruach can give us a life previously undreamed of, life out of death. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.